in business running Berkshire for 58 years, and I've never found economic forecasts of any use to the company. And, and all we have to do is keep running every business as well as we can, and we got to keep plenty of cash on hand so that people can keep making intelligence decisions rather than those forced upon them. And that's all we know how to do. And if I depended in my life on economic forecasts, you know, I don't think we could make any money. I don't know how to do it. Even though the 2023 economy is looking to be in really bad shape thanks to soaring inflation, back-to-back -back interest rate hikes, and the stock market plummeting for over 12 months, there are still many investors who have been buying while the majority have been selling. If we look at Warren Buffett, for example, he's just recently invested huge amounts in 2022 after sitting on the sidelines for quite a while. Funnily enough, this behavior isn't for this year only. He's also invested huge amounts during the 2020 COVID crash, the 2008 bubble burst, and also again in 2001. And he's not the only investor who's done this either. When you look back on it, it's easy to see just how great of an investment decision he made because he and other investors decided to invest during an economic downturn. If you want to start making the big bucks like Warren Buffett, then there are three rules that you absolutely have to remember to come out on top. Fortunately, we have the incredible Monish Pabrai, who is a known disciple of Warren Buffett and great friends with Charlie Munger, who will tell us all there is to know. Recently, he's gone into incredible detail to explain these three rules, and the first of these is very useful in economic downturns. It's to find companies with a competitive edge. Let's say you have some, some small city in, in England and it has no Thai restaurant, for example. And uh, someone looks at it and say, yeah, I think your Thai restaurant do really well here. And they open a Thai restaurant and they do really well and uh, they're full all the time and they can charge premiums versus London and other cities. That is going to attract more people and more entrepreneurs to open Thai restaurants until eventually the economics of the Thai restaurants in that small city may be no different from other parts of England. The nature of capitalism is such that if someone builds a better mousetrap, which, you know, grows a company and generates high returns on equity and very profitable and so on, they have a target on their back. And in general, that will attract a lot more competitors to enter your space. And they'll try to chip away at whatever advantage is there. The thing about companies is that being first is an incredible feat, but it's not always going to secure your business. For example, Snapchat was the first company to introduce stories, but has since lost its popularity. Atari was the first company to produce a gaming console, but the majority of people have never even heard of the name before, even avid gamers. Lastly, Motorola made the first cell phone, and not surprisingly, is a name that many of the younger generations have never heard. So, as nice as being first is, it's not a guarantee that it is a good business. What you need to look for is a characteristic that sets the business apart from its competitors. Something that is so irreplaceable, no matter how hard the other companies try to replicate it, they can't. The term used for this is called a moat. There is one type of moat that is impossible to replicate, which Monish speaks about in this clip. Being the brand it is today. And actually, quite frankly, there's nothing particularly magical about Coke in the sense that they say they have the formula locked up in some bank vault in Atlanta. But it's really easy to clone Coke, and several companies have done that. When Pepsi introduced the Pepsi Challenge in the 1980s, they basically gave people two colas to drink with no brands on them, and they said, tell us which one is better. And uh, most people preferred Pepsi it was, because it was a little sweeter. And then after they took the test, they would tell them, oh, by the way, you preferred Pepsi. But if they presented the two drinks to most people with the brands, Coke and Pepsi, most people would prefer to take Coke. So Coke's moat is, if you look at it, kind of objectively, it really doesn't make any sense. They have a product that can be very easily cloned. They have competitors in many cases who have better products, but a brand got built. The most powerful moats are typically brand moats. As Manish said, Coca-Cola was objectively proven to be less desirable than Pepsi when the drinks were tested without a label. In other words, for the flavor, Pepsi always won out. 
However, when the labels were presented, without question, the majority of people picked Coca-Cola. So, when you're looking for a business to invest in, you want to make sure that they have a desirable brand name that actually causes people to live counterintuitively. In other words, people continue to buy the product regardless of the current economic conditions. These strong moats are almost recession resistant because even if the product is more expensive than the competitor during an economic downturn, people will still buy it. One example of this is Ferrari. There are tons of cars that are cheaper, and there are even cheaper hypercars. Yet the one that everyone wishes they could own is a Ferrari. It's also clear that the demand for it never drops. Another example is Louis Vuitton purses. Funnily enough, there are tons of purses that are made from the same materials and are significantly cheaper. Yet everyone wants to have a Louis Vuitton purse. With that said, no moat lasts forever, so you need to take measures to check if a moat can really endure or not. The nature of capitalism is that moat is very likely eventually to get filled in. So if we go back in history, we look at businesses that have survived and thrived for a long time. Very few businesses that are founded make it past their first year. A few will make it past their fifth year and even fewer will make it past their 10th year, 20th year, 30th year. It just keeps going down. When we look at businesses that may look dominant today, our job as investors is to project what these businesses may look like 5, 10, 20 years from now. And that is a very difficult exercise because you have all these marauding in intruders who want to take away your moat, who want to take away those profits, and they're continuously coming at you. That's what makes this a fun and exciting endeavor from my point of view, because trying to figure those things out is not that straightforward. A great example of a company with a moat, both for branding and stitching, is Apple. However, even though Apple is prospering right now, chances are it won't last forever. If you want to keep track of moats, then we can use the fill town exercise. Essentially, you want to research the long-term track record of the last 10 years of the company. Specifically, the earnings per share, revenue, free cash flow, and equity. If it's been growing consistently over 10% per year for the last 10 years, it's likely a very good company to buy in. Looking at Apple, they tick all the boxes, with the exception of equity, but that's because they often buy back their own shares. For the most part, though, it's a strong grower because they've been able to grow unhindered for a very long time. What you can look for when it comes to moats that are potentially weakening are declining sales or margins, negative media sentiment or news reports, or closing stores. The moat is the first key for a value investing in difficult economic times. So one of the arrows in our quiver as value investors is patience. So in general, we don't really have, for the most part, an information edge. So if I'm looking at a business, there's not much I'm going to be able to come up with about that business that a lot of other people haven't figured out or are capable of figuring out. Then there can be another edge, which is an analytics edge, which is two individuals have the same information, but one person is able to look at that data and come to conclusions that are different from the other person. And so an analytic edge can be a real edge. But even that is difficult because there's a lot of smart people looking at a lot of companies. The one edge that is probably the strongest is, is the time horizon. And even Jeff Bezos says that a lot of his competitors are focused on the next one, two or three years. And he said that Amazon always took the approach of looking out longer looking out five or seven or 10 years. And he said that when they looked out longer and they invested with that longer time horizon, they got an edge and they were willing to make investments where they knew that the payoff is not going to come in three years. This knowledge applies to companies, but it also does to us investors as well. In fact, it's one of the most important tools you can have as an individual investor. The biggest advantage you can have is making sure that you have long time horizon and an outlook for the companies that you're invested in, especially if you're the only one managing your money. The thing is, no one will kick you out if you haven't made 20% by the end of the quarter. Surprisingly, it's the exact game being played by active fund managers on Wall Street. They're basically trapped into thinking short term only. Monish, on the other hand, confidently says that value investing is a game of patience. You want to buy great companies and just wait. It's actually quite boring. It requires you to know how to sit still and not take any action. 
You want to buy during a crisis, wait for it to blow over, let the recovery kick in, and wait to make your profits. But this can take anywhere from one year to even five years or longer. Just remind yourself that you can wait. Be patient about those great opportunities and hold up business for the long term. So I think, yes, a, the ability of an investor to think longer term, and this is one of the reasons why the index does so well. The index is too dumb to know that it owns Microsoft. It's too dumb to know that it owns Alphabet. And it's too dumb to sell these things. And it keeps these things endlessly forever. So if you look at the S&P 500 index, for example, which is 500 for the most part great businesses. And every year they might take one or two businesses out and replace them with one or two new ones. But usually the ones they take out are not the ones that are climbing. Like recently they removed General Electric from the Dow Industrial Average. And if you look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average over time, in general, you get rising stars going in and you get companies that have passed their prime being taken out. The S&P 500 would hold an Apple or a Microsoft or a Amazon or Alphabet for 20 years, 30 years. And that type of holding period on these great businesses can be a great edge. Would you believe me if I told you that the S&P 500 has beaten over 90% of active fund managers over the long term? This just clarifies how negatively a short-term mindset can affect an investor. If you want to stay around investing for the long term and constantly beating the returns of the market, always look for those proven moats. If you can do that, you'll avoid a ton of long-term loss risk because you can even profit if you make a mistake in your valuation. The second approach is where you identify a great compounder that because of people not willing to look at the right time horizons and you can look around the corner, you could pay what would be either a reasonable or even an expensive looking price and end up with a great result. I think you could have paid any multiple for Microsoft when it went public in the 80s, almost any multiple for Walmart when it went public in the 70s, and you would have still done extremely well. So if we, are, if we have a crystal ball that can tell us what a company might look like 50 years from now, 30 years from now, then, you know, we could buy something at a billion dollar market cap and it might become 200 billion. The major advantage with this strategy is that if you're focused on the really long term and buy very high quality businesses with moats that are expected to last, you can buy into a company that's relatively expensive, but still profit a ton in 10 to 15 years time. Of course, this doesn't mean to throw away valuation, but it's just comforting to know that you can buy a business at a fair price instead of a bargain and still make great profits out of it. In fact, this is exactly what Warren Buffett did with Coca-Cola and Apple, among many others. With that in mind, Monish brings up one more important point that you need to remember when you found that business. There are very few businesses in the universe of listed companies that would qualify as great business. Probably, I would say less than 5% or 3% of listed companies would qualify as great businesses. If you find yourself in the very happy situation of fractional ownership of one of those businesses. Hang on for dear life. This is the one of the biggest mistakes I've made over time. Guy owns a stake in Ferrari, thanks to Monish. Thank you, Monish, for giving Guy the <laughs> Ferrari stake. And Monish doesn't own Ferrari. And when I made the investment in Fiat Chrysler in 2012, when the market cap was 5 billion and their sales were 140 billion, Fiat Chrysler was trading at less than 4% of revenue. And 80% of Ferrari was inside that 6 billion. And plus there was all the Jeeps and Ram and Maserati, everything else in there. And at that time, Abrai Funds owned something like, an, something north of 1% of Ferrari. When I looked through the Ferrari stake and we made a lot of money on that investment. And one of the dumbest things I did was Ferrari looked optically expensive to me. And, and I sold and we would probably have three times that amount of money if I just kept the position. And like Charlie says, old too soon and wise too late. The final piece of the puzzle is that once you find a business with a great moat, you commit to owning it for a long time to compound your returns. And if you've bought it at a fair price, just hold on to it. Let the business do what it needs to do over a decade or even longer. For example, look at the last 20 years for companies like Amazon, Google, or Tencent. 
Of course, it's easier said than done, but understanding that you should only water flowers and remove weeds instead of the other way around is what will get you those big baggers. To recap, the three rules are Number 1. Find companies that have a characteristic that makes them irreplaceable. Number 2. Look to hold for the long term. Number 3. Don't panic sell, but hold on to companies until it properly compounds for you. These are the three lessons from Monish that can help you make money during a recession like the great investors. Make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel for the latest videos.